Hello, I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein for Interior Design, The New Freedom. Today we'll be talking to Warren Plattner, architect, interior designer, planner, who says he's just about the only architect who really believes that a building design comes from within. Perhaps you can tell us, Warren, what that really means and how your views are different from other people. Well, I think that most people that are designing buildings and even doing interior work in buildings, they think of of it as a package. They think of it as a they think of a building as an object in the landscape or in the city, and they 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 conceive of it that way, and then they make the space inside fit that. And they how fit do you that see envelope. It? And I try to think of what. How are you going to use the space in this building? How are you going to use the building? Uh, I could give an example, I think, of a specific example. For instance, uh, <clears throat> several years ago, we did a public library building. The building, the structure of the building and all the spatial arrangements and its arrangements in relation to the site and so on all develop from a concept of what the building should be inside. There is nothing imposed from, from, the, uh, from a conception of what the structure of the building should be and then adapting that to an interior needs. And the first thing in thinking about that building, the first step that we took was I tried to conceive of what would be the best atmosphere, the best character for a small town public library building. In other words, where would you like to go to uh, look for books, perhaps to sit down and read a book, anyway to browse uh, well, how innovative can you be in a library? There are books, and there are stacks, and there are lights, and there are desks, and there are yeah. chairs. And what did you do? Well, <clears throat> the first thing that we did with, those with that concept was to think of it as a donut. In other words, if you add many individual uh, intimate spaces, small in scale, and you arrange them around an opening in the middle, a garden court, then, and this was all a very glassy, transparent uh, space in the middle of the building, then you could immediately, as you entered the building, you could see across that court and you could see all the other spaces and you could understand the building. So that the first concept is obviously an interior concept. How are you going to use the building? What is the space to be like inside the building? One of the things that you all pride yourself on is the unusually broad range of services that you offer. That include that range, I guess, from building design to furnishings, to lighting, to landscape design. How does that all work? Are there specialists among the 40? Uh, Do you have a landscape architect? Do you really. have a lighting designer, a furniture designer? Not really. We're all architects. Almost everyone in my firm are trained as architects. <laughs> They studied architecture in various schools. And uh, uh, what I try to develop in the people that work with me, as well as in myself, is, a, is versatility. And uh, my feeling is that as far as, as, far as education goes, uh, that architecture, an architectural education, is a very thorough one and encompasses uh, virtually uh, every aspect of the plastic arts and it also en encompasses aspects of engineering and many other uh, disciplines and therefore architects can do almost any design task if they wish to do so uh, and if they care enough about what they're doing. With 40 such versatile associates, how many jobs can you take on at any given time? Well, we limit ourselves to the number of projects that we take for several reasons. One is that I, uh, I don't wish to be an administrator, I don't wish to be an organizer, I don't wish to be just a salesman. I am interested in doing the work myself. How many jobs so are you all working on I now? Can, 
I can handle somewhere between eight and 12 or 15 jobs total at, at any given time. You said, and you said it often, that architecture is design, not a personal expression, like painting, sculpture, and the other arts. The architect is here to serve others' needs, not to express himself. Mm -hmm. That's not a very widely shared view, is it? That's right. I don't think that's what an architect or designer should be doing. He's, his task is to serve people's needs, and he should not be imposing his, his uh, psychological views and so on on other people. He should be serving them. How and at what stage in the design process does the client become involved? I could answer that question this way by saying that I think the best client is the most interested one. An apathetic client is a, a, a very poor client indeed, and a, a client who's bu too busy to pay attention to his project. I, I like a client, client who cares. And uh, if he cares, he's interested in what's being done, and he's fascinated with it, and he, he uh, He's going to uh, react to what is presented to him as, uh, uh, as ways of resolving his needs, and he's going to contribute to it, and I like that. I don't care where the ideas come from. They don't have to come from me. They don't have to come from other people in my organization, as long as the ideas come. You set up your own practice a little less than 15 years ago. Before that, you worked with Raymond Lowy, Eero Saarinen, the inheritors, the successors of the Saarinen office, and even yeah. very briefly for IMP. What in that experience, in that range of experience, has helped make you the kind of versatile designer that you are? Well, of course, my experience with, with Raymond Lowy Associates showed me that uh, it could be fascinating and worthwhile to pay attention to uh, a very simple object like the glass there. Uh, where does architecture end? You know, uh, where does space end? The objects in space modify the space and, uh, and have a lot to do with the success of it. So how successful the object is is important too. So I learned that, uh, I suppose, uh, at, least, at least it was brought home to me in a very clear way that I could design all those things and uh, make them happen. Uh, uh, from Aero Saarinen, I learned that hard work is really very worthwhile. He was an extremely hard-working person, and he, he, he really lived architecture all the time. And uh, his work was his life, and mine has become the same way, and I think that's the most important thing I learned from him. Was it while you were at Saarinen that you became particularly interested in the interiors of buildings and the technology? and the new frontiers of technology as well. Yes, as, as to interior architecture and attention to the interior, uh, I discovered that we uh, were, in a way, we were slighting that. We were, we were designing buildings as if they were systems uh, and that their systems were the most important thing. And uh, actually, it, to be very specific, it, it, it came about in a, in, a, in, a <clears throat> in a rather obvious manner. One of the things that an architect does is he determines all the materials of a building, and, and he usually determines the colors that, that things are painted or that the materials have. Was there any particular circumstance or individual or incident to help direct your interest? Well, when I was a boy, I used to like to make things with my hands. Nothing very significant, but I made birdhouses and things like that. And, uh, and I was very interested in materials. 
the flowers remind me of the fact that I thought of flowers as a material and I used to like to arrange flowers because I thought of it like sculpture if you put these over there and these here and so on that you can make something of it. You've since gone on obviously to far more permanent installations and more innovative ones as well. One of the things that your firm prides itself on is its role in developing original systems. Perhaps you can tell us about some of them. We did a project called the Jensen Design Center and it uh, doesn't exist anymore because the company went out of business and so on. Uh, and the space doesn't exist and the design doesn't exist. But that very small project, it was about 12,000 square feet, uh, that very small project had in it uh, many things that we conceived of which are now fairly ubiquitous in the in the architecture and design world. Can you be specific with some and of them? It w yes, I can, but I'd like to point out that it was a very purposeful thing. We didn't do it arbitrarily, but one of our tasks was to, was to put George Jensen on the map as a factor in, uh, in uh, uh, furniture and lighting and fabrics to the trade. And uh, we did that several ways there. Uh, the most unusual way we did it was by projection. We, we had a, uh, opposite the entrance, when you came off the elevators, we had a very large white wall and the space was not dark, but it was relatively dimly lighted. And we projected images on that wall that were three-dimensional images of objects and places and buildings and interiors and so on. In other words, rather than just light the floor or objects or the whole space with light, we created by using framing projectors and masks and stencils, we created uh, very special lighting effects the way theater designers had been doing for a long time, but nobody had ever done that in interior design or architecture before. That is also a very popular thing today. Another thing that we did was we used for the first time in this country anywhere, we used all glass detailing for our partitions so that the partitions mm -hmm. were pieces of glass from floor to ceiling and uh, they were braced by other pieces of glass that were at right angles to the main pieces of glass. And we used silicone fill joints and patch hardware and all those things that are very, very ubiquitous today. Among the interiors for which you are best known are the Ford Foundation interiors. And I guess uh, an interior that was the most widely talked about restaurant of the 1970s, and I'm thinking of Windows on the World, which is atop the World Trade Center in New York. I think it was Paul Goldberger, the architecture critic of the New York Times, who says that your style might be called sensuous modernism. And I think what he means is lush, rich materials that have a clean line. Would that be an accurate or a fair description? It's it's reasonable, yes. <laughs> How would you describe your work? <laughs> well, if I were to describe Windows on the World, for instance, I would have to say that our first thought there was to make people comfortable. Uh, when you go out to dine, it's a very special occasion. You're not just going out to eat. And when you go to a restaurant, you're you're uh, looking for a little bit of, uh, of uh, an effect that you cannot get at home or any other place. Well, was the intent uh, to innovate or was the intent to create a comfortable setting? A comfortable setting, number one. Uh, entertainment, number two. People, people, well, to give you an idea about what I mean by a comfortable setting, when you go to a place like Windows on the World, of course, there's a view there, and you might think that everyone would wish to sit as close to the windows as possible, and they would think that they had a second-rate table if they weren't. 
So one of the tasks at Windows on the World was to make every table and every seat the best seat in the house. Well, how do you give everybody and a slice of the view in a limited space? It's not only a slice of the view, but if but some people have a better view than others, so you give them compensating things. That's very complicated for me to describe. Well, perhaps you a, could give us some, for example, a, there are niches there. I assume that's com the further yes. from the window, the more decorative the little environment. And the more intimate. So those little alcoves at the back of the, of the restaurant, the largest dining room, uh, those little alcoves are really in a way the best place to sit because they're the most intimate of the spaces and yet you have a view from there even though you're furthest away from the windows. It's one example of, about, of how you uh, might go about and how we did there uh, uh, trying to make people especially comfortable. And by comfort, I mean many different things, of course, not just physical comfort, but psychological comfort, too. Do you ever expect the restaurant to be the popular success that it was? When Guy Tizzoli, the director of the World Trade Center, first came to me, he said, uh, uh, we would like to have uh, the finest uh, business luncheon club uh, in the city uh, within our... Uh, projected budgets and uh, but he said we can't afford to have a place that simply serves lunch uh, we can't justify that so we have to have a public restaurant at night uh, a commercial operation and he said you're gonna have a very hard time getting people down here it was a personal objective to make it as successful as possible, and by success I mean popular. I was not interested in telling people about how Warren Plattner conceives of a restaurant. I was interested in making it a place where people would really wish to be. And uh, so there was that element of it, but there was also the charge from the client that, by God, it better be successful because uh, people aren't just going to happen in here, they're going to have to come on purpose. Why don't you tell us about some of the lush and sensuous materials that you use there to lure them downtown? Well, we laid it on. Uh, <laughs> you said it. <laughs> the, uh, perhaps, the, perhaps the best example is the men's toilet room. Uh, the men's toilet room has a silk ceiling and pink marble and uh, a lot of mirrors and a lot of lights. And uh, that was a very purposeful thing. Uh, I conceived that the entire experience of going to dine at Windows on the World was the important thing, that any part of that is part of the experience. Uh, and, of course, as you know, the best advertising for any restaurant is word-of-mouth advertising. If people go away talking about it and they're saying nice things, it doesn't matter what they're talking about. You ended up doing a restaurant in Kansas City as well. That was sort of a valentine and not by accident to that city. Well, the reason for... The, the, it wasn't consciously a valentine, but our clients were Hallmark, the, the uh, uh, greeting card people. And there's a certain aesthetic implied there very pretty cute things and uh, the intent was to do something very special for them there's no reason why Kansas City shouldn't have uh, a particular uh, character and a particular style and a particular design uh, just the way Windows on the World has its character and design so I'm always looking, when I start a project, I'm always looking for what is the hook to hang it on? You know, where does the conception come from? And uh, thinking of uh, Crown Center, which was the name of the project, group of buildings, and thinking of the client and their principal business being greeting cards, I, I did something that's like a lace vi valentine, I suppose that's, that's the, it was described that way by by somebody else. I didn't describe it that way, but it's an apt, it's very pretty. One of the largest projects that you worked on 
was Water Tower Place in Chicago. It's a whole city block in Chicago, 70 stories high. That is, I guess, what you would call an instant landmark. More people meet at the interior of that central elevator shaft than most any other place in Chicago. What specific design problems did such a project present to you? The water tower place is a very large building. It's 70 stories high. It's a whole city block. It has no exterior space to speak of. The building goes from, from sidewalk to sidewalk and sidewalk to sidewalk, the entire block. Uh, and it's packed with many different functions. There are 50 stories of apartments. There's a 20-story hotel. Uh, there's an office building. Uh, there is one of the largest shopping centers in the world within the building. Uh, four theaters, uh, a parking garage, and other things. And most of that Virtually all of that was going to be buried out of sight vertically up within the building uh, <clears throat> because obviously you have to have street frontage to approach your hotel, you have to have street frontage to approach the apartments. Uh, there were two big department stores and they had to have some street frontage and so on. So there was no way that you could do a shopping mall in the conventional sense that you could see it from mm -hmm. the street. Uh, as a matter of fact, the malls at Water Tower Place start two levels above the street, and one of the things we had to do was to make an entrance to it that was so compelling, so inviting, and so dramatic that you couldn't fail to want to go up there and check it out. Well, almost like an English garden, you've lured them level after level. And uh, so our concept was to, in effect, extend the street and extend the sidewalk, but as a tropical garden, sort of as a tropical uh, Villa d'Este at Tivoli, I suppose you would say, uh, to lead you up to the, where the malls begin and which you can't see from the street at all. And uh, so our original concept for that portion of the building, uh, the mall started with that idea of how are you gonna pull people up there? Uh, there's some interesting detail there. For instance, it's a long ways, both vertically and horizontally, up those escalators and their stairs also, because there have to be by law. But uh, uh, it's a long ways from where you enter to where you reach the top uh, and where the malls begin. And uh, one of the things that we did that I don't think most people realize is we use false perspective there and the escalators diverge as they go up. They're not parallel to each other. Uh, and as you know, uh, in perspective, uh, parallel lines converge on a point in the distance. And if you spread the lines apart, it makes the distance seem closer to you. And uh, the Conversely, if you make them falsely converge, it makes it seem farther away. So one of the things we did is arrange that space and the elements in it so it made the distance from the bottom to the top seem much shorter than it was. Of course, when you come out of the malls, it's the reverse, but we've had you then, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you're on your own. Yeah. One of the most neglected areas of design are offices the place where most of us spend most of our time. What is the prospect for a more humane use of human beings in their offices? I care very much about the quality of what we do. I don't care about the quantity of what we do. Uh, I care about every detail of what we're concerned with. And I think that is the answer to what makes spaces with with uh, livable quality, with workable quality, that, uh, spaces that make life worth living, uh, that enrich one's life, that makes one feel comfortable, all the things that, that uh, should happen uh, when buildings and the spaces in them are, are uh, determined. Uh, 
unfortunately, I think the the uh, the trend in my profession is exactly against that. Architectural firms are getting larger and larger and larger, and there's becoming a whole new profession called interior design, and there are interior design firms that aren't architects at all. That How do we are, feel about that? Are do dividing it. I, I don't think it's a good idea to divide it. I think that's an abdication of, of uh, responsibility on the architect's part. You think uh, all interior designers should be architect trained? Yes, I do. Uh, I think that there are many disciplines that they lack if they don't have architectural educations. And uh, how do you make the distinction between an interior designer and an interior decorator? I'm both. And I'm an architect. How do you live? What's a Warren Plattner house like? My own house is, uh, it's formal. Uh, it has distinct rooms and spaces in it. Definitely rooms. It's not one space sliding into another. Uh, by formal, I mean it has very definite form. It's not casual. Uh, on the other hand, I like to lie on the floor, and, uh, and I, I'm very dressed up today. Usually I uh, wear some old Levi's and a work shirt. Uh, I like to live informally in formal spaces, but you have to understand what I mean by form. I think we began yeah. to for sharing the really extraordinary range of your expertise and experiences with us and in doing it in such a generous way. Our thanks to you, Warren Plattner, and thank you, audience, for being with us, too. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein for Interior Design, The New Freedom. Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.